Welcome friends to this afternoon session of our monthly meeting. <clears throat> I mentioned to you in the morning session different levels of wakefulness. They also call different levels of consciousness, different levels of awareness, different regions, different worlds, different universes. It doesn't matter what you call them. They are what they are. And to access them, as I said, you can access them accidentally, like one can wake up in a sleep and then go back to sleep. You can access them by a traumatic experience in the dream or a traumatic experience in this wakeful state. You can access them to some extent by an effort. Now the effort that you make and how it works is very unique and is only available to us in this human body, not at the other dream level, nor at the higher wakeful level. It is very interesting that when we talk of dream within dream within dream, it should be further away from reality. Not so. There are some features that can be more real in a dream than in a wakeful state. The unique feature in this wakeful state or this dream state we are in right now is that here we can use our mind to think that we can decide whatever we like. We have a choice. The choices in dreams are very limited. We hardly make them and move on. Choices here are not, not very flashy. We get time. Should I do it or not? Should I do it or not? It's good to do it or not. Is this better or that better? We get an experience of deliberation. Deliberate upon it. We don't have that experience in any other state of wakefulness except the state of totality. Except in the state of oneness. We call oneness the real creating power that's creating everything. And we call that oneness into God. People say, man is made in the image of God. What does it mean? Does God have a face and eyes and nose like us? Or is he just a creative power? What is this resemblance? How has man been made in the image of God? And we hear it over and over again. What is similar? The similarity is that we have an experience in the physical body of making a choice. And we call it free will. Because we use our will to decide to go here or there, do this or not to do this. It's a genuine experience. Nobody can deny. If somebody comes to me and says, I want to deny that I have free will. I said, you are saying this exactly out of your free will. You could have said I have free will, now you are deciding not to have free will. You are using free will right here. Every day, in almost every hour, Perhaps every few minutes we use our power of free will. The free will is a real experience. Nobody can deny it. Is it really free? Then that's a big question. Because what we call free will is based upon the way we are trained inside our head to make decisions and those factors which operate to make us go this way or that way. What are those factors in human life? Only at this level. The factors responsible for our decision making are two categories. Hereditary. I am offering somebody tea or coffee. Do you want tea or coffee? Hmm, I'll take coffee. He thinks he's deciding now. What, what has gone in his head to take coffee. His father could be drinking coffee, his grandfather could be, gone in his genes, DNA is carrying the information, 
that coffee is good. He has been drinking coffee a hereditary reason. Or second set of reasons, he has been with people who liked coffee. He was their friend. He also had coffee with them. These two reasons, one is hereditary, one is acquired. The moment he is deciding to have tea or coffee, both are entirely fixed. The past up to that moment has already happened. He is not going to change his hereditary, nor the acquired period. So the truth is that even though we are using our brain, the brain works on these two factors, which at the time of making any choice is already fixed. So even at the physical level, we really have no free choice. Looks free. Looks free because we don't know what the hereditary factors are and we totally forgotten how we acquired it. Just because we have forgotten something looks like free will. But there is another way of finding out. A more accurate way of finding out do you have real free will or not? And that is to go to the area inside yourself, in the real self, and the real self within the real self, where you can see how your mind operates. And, the, uh, the, and how the mind creates time, creates cause and effect, how time places events on time and space. When you have that experience, you discover any time you go in there, the way the brain made decisions here were all pre-recorded there in time. And the decision you will make in the future already recorded there in time. Your personal experience, personal verification, what we thought was real free will was not really free, it was predetermined. But what is the idea of having a predetermined freedom and then making us believe it is real here? Any purpose in that? Very big purpose. If we did not have the experience of free will, we could never become a seeker. We could never call for the friend to wake us up. The seeking comes from free will. Seeking comes by making a choice. Should I search for it? Should I seek for it? Should I go to a meeting for that? Should I read a book for that? These are all acts of free will. And therefore, free will Merely the experience of free will need not be real or not. Merely the experience of free will generates experience of seeking. Very important function. Could we do it better way? You know, I like to think of it. Could we do it better way? Yeah, we did do a better way. Much better way. But I'm not telling you that. <laughs> no, I tell you. <laughs> the better way is where did we design the whole thing in totality? Does totality have free will? There is nothing else to do but free will. <laughs> consciousness. If we describe totality as consciousness, totality of consciousness. Why I'm using this word? Consciousness. Because if we had no consciousness, we had no experience. That's based upon the fact we all have conscious experiences. We are defining consciousness as that which can create an awareness of experience. If we are having experience here, surely the self that is having experience is a conscious being. It is a conscious entity. It has the power to be conscious of, of what? Of what it wants to be. Free will. Real free will exists at totality and the experience of free will exists here. Now, is free will here real when it's predetermined? Who predetermined it? The top? Yourself? Therefore, even the apparent free will, which looks predetermined, is really free at the top. It's a wonderful system that here is real free will of the totality operating to create the experience of free will here. Can you call it? Just because the intermediate stage, it is predetermined. Does it make it unreal? No. So free will is real, but predetermined. 
that looks a little odd, is predetermined at the highest point where <coughs> they will to have the free will. So that is why free will is a very interesting subject. If you study it superficially here, only here is real free. We have no information of the future. We try to make decisions, they go wrong. We try to anticipate what will happen, it doesn't happen. So free will here is very valuable, it's not really accurate. But we make mistakes. Because we make mistakes, we say yes, it's real free will, we failed or we passed. But when you go to two steps higher in the discovery of your own self, you discover that the way you think and the way you do these things is predetermined. Some people think it's law of karma, which says all decisions are predetermined. But the law of karma says you are born with a destiny, which they call in India pralab. Pralab is the destiny you are born with, it's based upon your past life. In this life, you have two types of events happening events happening on their own, events happening with your free will. At least the experience of free will. The two are distinguished. Events happening on their own are your destiny. No control over them. Events you are creating with your free will, you think you have control over them, therefore they are different. If karma is based upon creating events, then you are creating your events here, using your free will, that's why the law of karma says, if you do good, you are rewarded. You do bad, rewarded. If free will was not a real experience, you could neither do good nor bad. Everything would be fixed. Why are we responsible? Some people say, if it is my karma to do this, why am I responsible? But you create it. That's the law of karma itself explaining that if you do good, you will be rewarded. You do bad, you will be punished. Therefore, you are responsible for it because you assume responsibility. But if we go higher and find that the way we decided ourselves was also predetermined, does karma still exist the way we know it? Answer is no, it doesn't. Karma becomes as much of an illusion as the rest of the illusion. There is no real karma at all. It's just an experience. Just an experience in three levels. The physical level, astral level, causal level. But we have no free will there, not like we have here, because we have too much knowledge there. Too much knowledge in the astral about the future. Full knowledge of the future in the causal level. There can't be a karma when we know it, because we do, can't do anything. Therefore, the area of experiences, the level of experience where karma according to law of karma can be created is only the human life, not any other life. But the pral of the karma where you can pay off and have experiences without creating physical dream state, further dream state, astral state, causal state. We have one state where we create karma, the large number of areas where we can pay off. Get rewarded or punished. That's the law of karma. It's very interesting. It is physical form. Human form is not the only physical form of life. We have a lot of forms of life. Birds, insects, angels. We don't know angels whether they exist or not. But we believe there could be angels. Some people feel they have got angels sitting on their shoulders. Some come and help are helped by their angels. Some are not good angels, some demons come, all kinds of things people imagine are forms of life. How many forms of life? Long ago, it appears somebody counted. I don't know how accurate the count was, but it added up to 8.4 million. And that guy was so clever in mathematics. He told us exactly what the series of the curve will be. That out of 8.4 million, 5.6 million will be in the plant kingdom. So many will be in the insect kingdom. So many in this. Human being comes with the last small list of 400,000. 
That's where humans come and there he has added angels and demons and all that. He's added those in that list. It's very interesting, we call it 84, law of 84, 84 uh, lakhs, which is 8.4 billion. That sometimes you say, if you are born here in physical form, the possibility is you could be in any of those forms. If you are born as a human being, creating a karma as a human being, so what are the possibilities of paying off that karma? Not only these three levels, 8.4 million forms of life. They say that all the animals you see sometimes have been human beings. There is a sect called Jam sect, and they believe their life in, in plants, vegetables, for example. They say you have a potato. Potato is pulled out from the ground and killed. You're killing a life. To be totally vegan, non -veget vegetarian, not destroying life, you can't even eat a potato. But they also, the deepest literature in Jainism says a potato has thousand lives, not one life. And thousand lives are stored in this potato, which means you cannot be a potato if you don't have thousand past lives. When we look at this kind of description of how we are here, that we have had so many forms, many of us might be potatoes. Some are some <laughs> potatoes even now. <laughs> we can imagine what a big range of possibilities is there to for what? To pay off karma. No free will. Great well, no free will. Sorry. <laughs> but we have free will only in one level. How can we create so much karma in one lifetime to have so many forms of life to pay off? That's a very good question. People miss the answer. People think karma means action. And karma is created by your action. Wrong. Karma is created by your intention, not action. The severity of its results, punishment or reward, increases if the intention is also carried out. But karma is created with intention. Now imagine how bright we are with our minds. We are intending to do things every day, every moment. We create so much karma, there is no possibility whatsoever to put it in one lifetime. Therefore, we generate so much karma in one life, it takes a long time over several forms of life to pay off. How, how is it determined what karma creates what reaction? I, I hit some man, he'll be born again, he'll hit me. That is simple. But supposing the man who hits you has gone to heaven. He doesn't want to come here. Are you free from karma? No, you will have to fall and hit the same way. That's another big mistake people think. That karma is settled by repeat of the same action. No, it's the experience that you feel. The experience you generated, the experience you get. So, the payoff can be in very different forms than what you think you created. This is a, a wonderful. These are dictated as laws of on which we are living. Is karma a good law or a bad law? People who think of good and bad are always discussing everything, good or bad. And uh, it becomes very difficult for a person who has gone above the causal plane to see what is good or bad, both are created equally. Both are drama. Both are taking place on a stage, we call the world, the universe. Both are all characters of ourselves, wearing masks. So, how can there be good or bad if all of us are acting in masks as the same person? A person who has reached that point cannot call anything good or bad. Everything exists. It's an existence that he looks at. We are sitting here with our mind. To work on the law of karma, we divide it into good and bad.
How do we determine what is good and bad? Is there a special code sitting inside? Is there a book that we read inside? No. Good and bad is developed by the traditions, culture, where we are born. Depending upon the time and place of birth, the whole morality is set at that time. The morality is set by the religion your parents follow. By this exposure you have had to people. They all influence your thinking of what is good and bad. What was good a hundred years ago will be bad today. What was bad then becomes good now. Time changes all morality. Places change all morality. Go from one country to another, the law of good and bad is different. Good and bad is merely a creation to divide the impact of karma into two parts. That is why when we have these experiences of our intention, the karma is paid off in several different ways. Supposing we are very clever and we wake up, we leave the karma back in the dream state. Karma does not leave us. It comes up in the astral state. It comes up only to pay off, not to create. Pay off can take a long time, depending on how much karma we have. When we come across a perfect living master, and I must tell you, my definition of perfect living master is not any teacher, any master who can tell us things, but only one who has experienced totality and can, in a human being, know everything up to totality at all times, even as a human being. If that is not so, not a perfect living master. Master, all right. Guru, all right. But not a perfect master. Perfection comes with totality, not with lack of totality. Imperfection is lack of knowledge, full knowledge. That is why the perfection is there. When we say, the person perfectly the master comes to awake us. From which level he wakes us? The thought. What is his first action to make us wake up to the highest level first? First action. Cut out that huge reservoir of karma that we are carrying. So when we talk of karma, we say that with which we are born is problem of our destiny. That which we create is karaman or acquired karma. That which cannot be paid off with the reservoir we call sinchit karma. When such a friend appearing in a physical body with knowledge of totality comes and says, Come, friend, we are going home. What he's really saying is, Your sinchit karma is gone. Otherwise, the journey is too long. A very big change. One of the biggest changes that take place, we can't see it here. You can see it higher up. The biggest change that takes place is when a perfect living master accepts us as a friend. Sinchit karma, reserve karma is gone. It is at that very moment. Some people have said, what is initiation then? If he initiates such a thing, big thing can happen. What is initiation? There is a guy sitting in India telling my friends, your masters know nothing about initiation. They are telling you to repeat these five words and they call it initiation. That guy has no knowledge whatsoever of the teaching of great master at all. He has no knowledge of what initiation means. Initiation is not repetition of any mantra whatsoever. In reading of some mantras or the whole thing, we could all become perfect masters and tell everybody repeat these words. Repetition of words of physical activity here it can't be taking you anywhere. It's only a useful thing, very limited use in meditation in order to prevent the mind from thinking too many things. You make the mind repeat the words. It doesn't, you don't give him enough scope to think of other things. Very simple mechanical device. Mantra is only that. The holier you make it, the more easy to put attention on it. More easy to prevent the mind from scattered, scattering itself all over. It's just a method of meditation, not initiation at all. Initiation means 
when a perfect living master initiates, he says, he go back to totality. He goes. Guaranteed. No question. That's a very big difference from just teaching somebody meditation. That the awakened person has found the time for you based on your programming to wake up to the highest state. A perfect living master, when he initiates a person, he makes sure that that person, individual, will achieve the same totality which he has got in his physical body. Guaranteed. It may take time because we are sitting in time. He is appearing in time. He is appearing as an event in our life. So all the laws of events happen. Can we recognize such a person? There are today so many masters all around. Somebody did a research that how many masters are saying that they are follow up from great master Baba Sabar Singh. 500. That's plenty of good number from one single master. Just a few hundred, uh, less than 100 years. 500 master peers. Great master used to say, in India, masters are growing so fast. Today, there are more masters than fewer disciples. The gurus are growing. It's a very good business. You can make a lot of money out of it. People are tired of life. They are looking for some despite something. So that is why it's very difficult to know who is a guru. In our life, we come across so many masters. And then we go to a master. And we say, we hear him, we beat him, nothing happens. Maybe he is not a true master like I was thinking we should have. But I got initiated by him. I am bound now. I will be very unfaithful to try anybody else now. Almost equating the relationship, disciple and master, to that of a husband and wife. Is it very unfaithful and deserving of punishment? We get stuck. But some say we should go move forward and find who is the real one. And they move, carrying some guilt sometimes, sometimes overcoming guilt by rationalization or by some friend supporting. How do we know when to stop this search for masters? We don't know how to stop that. Because there is no way we can recognize a perfect living master. If a master is wearing special garbs, creating a special situation where you should come and see who he is, then he's showing off something at a physical level that is not perfect living master. We want to perfect living master to show something inside us, where the truth lies. What is inside us which can be most convincing and can overcome even the mind's doubt? If you look at life and see what exists in this life which can overcome your doubt, overcome your questioning, one thing, love. Experience of love. When you have experience of love, love pulls you. You don't push. But everything else you push. Everything else you have to search. Love pulls. You can't help it. When you are in love, your mind for the first time, your ego for the first time takes a back seat. Otherwise, always in front. I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to do this. In love, the beloved comes in front, the eyes for us. We have this experience right here. What do perfect living masters do? They create an experience in us of a certain kind of strange pull, which feels like we want to see them again. We want to look at them. Why? There's something there's there. Mind says, why? Waste your time. Why? Mind creates all doubts and we still want to go. This pool of love which comes out of the master overrides our doubts, 
overrides our thinking. Love is the answer. People say, whole spiritual path is love and devotion. Love and devotion, why they say use two words, love pulls. Our response to that is devotion, automatically. That kind of love which comes from a perfect living master makes us automatic devotees. You don't practice, how do I learn how to be devoted? Pull makes you devoted. Automatic is come. Therefore, I would say, we don't have too many signs by which we can really judge if an individual that we are meeting, even if he having a pull, is a perfect living master or not. But one thing is certain, the love of that master will be unconditional, completely, no judgment. The love will not be based on our karma. Love will not be based on whether we are good or bad. Love will not be based upon what we are doing in this life. Love will be based on our CK insight. What, how does a perfect living master look at us and we look at our sins and we say, I am such a bad person, how is he going to give me anything? He is not looking at the bad things or good things, he says the good and bad things are trapping you and he trying to take you out of the trap. That is why the love is filled with an immediate and amazing compassion for everybody. Very few people, even in the world, you can find. I have met people giving lectures when I was very young. One guy came to the Dera and he was talking of why I am reaching Para Brahma and Sarchikhar. He was describing like it's a journey through stages and he's flying up there. So I knew that. It is all talk. Even at a young age, I could feel it just talk. So I, and he was talking to a group of people. So I had a safety pin. I used to keep a safety pin attached to my handkerchief. I opened it up. I quickly went and poked it. He shouted, got so angry. So I could run faster than him, I knew. He chased me. All I remember saying, where are the five boys? In those days, we used to say that the five vices, anger and lust, and these are called five boys. I just shouted them back. You can provoke such a person with a simple pin. Try to provoke a perfect living master. No provocation ever works. No provocation. If it makes him angry, react on a perfect living master. So the uniqueness of a perfect living master is the unconditional love you will experience. You may not notice it the day one, you may notice on day two, but you will notice. The more you associate with a person like him, how can he always be calm? Never ruffled by anything. How can he always be loving? Never saying anything against anybody. Why? How is that possible? It's possible. It's possible with perfect living master. The other thing also, perfect living master never declare we are master. If they want to declare they are master, then they try to show off again. They never declare. Perfect living master never say we are masters. They just come to say we are come to serve people. So, but secretly, they have already attained what we all want to attain as spiritual seekers. So that is why this is a very big sign. They won't perform public miracles to show what we can do. They won't do levitation and so we can do things against the laws of nature. They will live as naturally as possible, as much like us as possible, and be as ordinary as possible, not extraordinary. Those who are not perfectly master want to show they are extraordinary. The perfectly master want to show they are ordinary. Why? They want to make us friends of theirs. Not disciples, friends. Friendship is between ordinary people, not extraordinary people. An ordinary people cannot be a friend of an extraordinary person. He can be adoring the extraordinary person. He can be worshipping him. He can do anything. Not friend. Friendship is with ordinary people to come like us. I sometimes give example. If a master were to come into this hall and comes flying in the sky, 
you will all start looking there, you only will listen to me. So much impact it will have on you. Just by the power of levitation. What will your mind be thinking at that time? Some of you will think there must be some wire attached. Just a trick. There is no, ma no, no magic. Nobody can fly high. So there is some trick involved. And like magicians do, they fly also in the space. This guy is flying like that. Some will say, amazing. This is real levitation. Some may get so freaked out and even faint to see that. Nobody will love that master. Not even one person. Supposing while he's doing that trick of flying, he falls down here. I know all these people sitting will run to help him. And first time, a little love and compassion will come in our hearts. Don't forget, this friendship, the love that comes with friendship, comes between ordinary. Therefore, masters are perfectly masters, as ordinary as you can assume. If they are so ordinary, it becomes more difficult to recognize them. You cannot recognize them. But the beauty is, we cannot recognize them, they can recognize us. They can see our seeking without our speaking. They appear in our life when we are ready. They appear automatically. They appear in strange coincidences. They create circumstances and they appear. And our mind is still figuring out how they appear. The mind can't even understand how these coincidences happened, that they appeared in our life. They impress us with something that we can't explain too well with our minds. Over time, we realize they are the masters, perfectly the masters. So, thank God, we can't find them, they can find us. All we need to do is to seek them, inside, not outside. We sit at the third eye center inside, seek, master will appear in your life. I have heard the story over and over again, all over and over again. Seek inside, master appears by coincidence. Thank you very much for joining me again and we meet again next month.